So why is it important? I kind of touched on that there. So it's important because it protects your domain name from spoofing, which is a technique that uh, fishers, spammers, and other scammers use, threat actors. They send email from your domain and also email deliverability. So it prevents domain spoofing, which is uh, probably the probably the biggest benefit. You know, uh, you can have your uh, reputation of your domain name ruined for, uh, by having someone send phishing emails with your domain name. A lot of spammers, malware senders, the works, just threat actors of all sorts, uh, try to use uh, uh, your domain to do it if they can. Uh, a caveat here is that um, this uh, email authentication doesn't protect you against you know, close spellings of your domain and that sort of thing. Just someone flat out using your domain. Then also, email delivered, oh, let me, one more point about, uh, about that. Um, just, uh, I, I wanted to note here that um, as evidence that email authentication is becoming more and more important, um, it's worth noting that um, October 16th of 2017, the Department of Homeland Security mandated that all federal agencies have full email authentication implemented, uh, including just the most aggressive DMARC policy, uh, which I'll get into a bit when we get to the implementation part, which says any inauthenticated email should be bounced. So that's, uh, I guess I take that as just another indicator among many that uh, email authentication is becoming more accepted and, and recognized as critical. And then, of course, um, there's email deliverability. Uh, email implementing email authentication is critical to consistently good email authentication. Uh, so an example of that in my own personal experience, just a recent one, is a client of mine, a small social media startup, was having trouble getting their, just their basic um, transactional emails delivered to the inbox. We, the only thing we did, you know, just changing one thing at a time, we, we implemented email authentication. They didn't have it implemented at all, really. And immediately, 20% uh, increase in their opens. While that metric is far from perfect, as you may know, it's still impressive, um, indicating that their delivery definitely improved. I, uh, the, well, the, the little pixel, one pixel uh, graphic, I know it's an imperfect metric, I acknowledge. But it, I still look at, here's why, how I use opens. He, he make, I think I know what you're getting at here. It's an imperfect metric. Uh, the, the way I look at, at opens is, is for changes. So if there's uh, a big increase in the opens or a big decrease, uh, I look at that as an indication that deliverability, there's something to look at in terms of deliverability improving or, or declining. I don't look at it as a sort of scientific measure. Does that, does that help at all? Yeah, but yeah, the pixel method is definitely flawed. Okay, so what is email authentication? So, in essence, uh, we're talking about a, tech, uh, a, a, uh, a Swiss Army knife, if you will, of techniques used uh, to allow senders to, you know, let receivers know uh, the source of the email and that the email is sent by someone authorized to send email on behalf of the domain operator. So that, uh, so if you have, you know, whether it's a postfix server or, or it's SendGrid, MailChimp, G Suite, whatever, um, you, if you're having, s if anyone's sending email, you want to authorize them and anyone who's, you know, isn't authorized, that you don't want to send email, you want the, you know, them cut off, so to speak. So I'll go through each of the components of email authentication here. The first one 
Sender Policy Framework, SPF. And here I'm going, uh, later I'll get into more details when we get into um, implementation, uh, deployment, uh, but here, uh, just sort of an overview. So a, a good way to send, think of Sender Policy Framework Record is a white list of the IP addresses that you, as the domain operator, have authorized to send email on your behalf using your domain. So it, and it's, it takes the form of a TXT, a DNS TXT record, uh, in, in which there are IP addresses directly, IP blocks using CIDR notation, and also there can be host names included, and you, by extension, get all the um, IP addresses uh, in the SPF record of any host that you include. So for example, let's say you sign up for G Suite to have your email, you wouldn't try to get the IP addresses in there, because there's a lot that Google could assign. So you just put, you include a host name they provide, and that host name takes, takes care of of uh, the IP addresses that uh, G Suite could apply. And we'll get into more details as I said. Okay, so the next, um, a few years after, so that was about 2002 for SPF, and then a few years later along came DCAM, Domain Keys Identified Email. And here, public key encryption, you know, a, a private and a public key, uh, you, uh, with your provider, you, get a, you generate a public key that you place as a TXT record in your DNS, and the sender actually signs the email with a digital signature of every single email. So let's go back to G Suite, uh, or it could be MailChimp, you name it, but they, or your PostFix server, whatever, Exchange, signs every single email that you send out that when somebody receives uh, with uh, an email, when a receiver receives it, they, uh, if the signature is good, if it passes DCAM, they know that it really came from that sender, you know, they, they vouch for it, and the email has not been altered in transit, which is kind of important too. And uh, just, uh, it's worth noting that the DCAM goes with the friendly from. So most of you are probably familiar with the, that email has basically two from addresses. You have your SMTP or your mail from, return path from, LO from, whatever you want to call it. SPF is done on that one. That's uh, where the email is really from. The sort of play from, the friendly from domain that, that the user sees that you put in, uh, that's the friendly from. Uh, and so DCAM is, the domain that DCAM uses is normally the friendly from, the one the users see. Okay, so you have these two, and then they, this was great, but the problem here, it, there's no, there was no uh, visibility in the, to, into what was going on with the, what, people didn't know what was going on with the email. Who's sending email, authenticated or not authenticated? Have I messed up with my email authentication somewhere? Is somebody using my domain to, f to send phishing emails? What do those emails look like? Those, you know, people want, want answers, and they also want some, wanted some teeth. So these are more, like SPF can tell uh, a receiver to bounce email, but they're not really going to listen. It's more of a suggestion. So it might help uh, with deliverability and so on, but chances are uh, the email is not going to flat out bounce, even if the SPF record, for example, tells the mailbox provider to bounce. So on top of this stack of SPF and DCAM, you have <laughs> domain-based message authentication reporting and conformance. Just call it DMARC. <laughs> Uh, so DMARC here is the policy uh, side of things. So this is, takes uh, what SPF and DCAM do the heavy lifting, and through DMARC you decide what you want to do with that information. Do you just want reports? Great, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, that's a window into your email streams. 
you with just reporting only, uh, you can find out who's sending email using your domain, and you might be surprised. You know, and uh, you can also find out about if you're a company, you might find out about email streams that, that while legitimate, you didn't quite know about. You know, there's this marketing firm over here using your domain to send these emails that was hired three years ago. Whatever, just there's things you find that you find through this process that you uh, that are legit but kind of have to be sort of brought into the fold. So it's a great way to kind of get your email under control. Um, larger corporations, this can be very complex. Smaller businesses, usually not. So that reporting uh, side of things can be very useful. But then with DMARC, and I'll go into that when we get into the deployment, uh, ha can brings the teeth of email authentication. So if you uh, graduate from just reporting, uh, it can get interesting. All right, so let's we'll start with in the same order we did before deployment. Um, and to reiterate, um, SPF uh, was implemented with the uh, mail from, the SMTP domain, uh, as opposed to the friendly from domain. And as I mentioned before, you can add IP addresses that you authorize to send email. Again, you're adding to a whitelist in essence. So uh, IP addresses, IP address blocks, and the hosts that, uh, f for uh, ESPs and, and so on. And, then, and um, while I'm not trying to be complete here, I want to bring attention to things that I think deserve attention. Um, there's a, lot, uh, there's a uh, mechanism that terminates all SPF records, and, and that mechanism is the all mechanism with a qualifier. And what I often see is um, people have a question mark all qualify for their S SPF record, which is neutral, which doesn't really do anything for, for you. It's basically saying, here's your whitelist, but it doesn't mean anything. So it's useful for testing so, and, and all that, but I would say uh, once you get beyond testing, you definitely want to go up to the tilde all, which is a soft fail, which at least you know, will help, help your deliverability. F it, those in the right list and, and those who are not in SPF record, it, it, could, it will uh, increase the chances they'll be added to the spam uh, because they're, you know, they're not authenticated. And then Dash all tells mailbox providers to bounce your emails. They're, as I mentioned before, they, they probably aren't going to, most of them aren't, until we get to DMARC. Um, and here's just a basic uh, SPF uh, record example. So there we have the version number, uh, SPF1. And uh, in keeping with the example I used earlier of, of G Suite. Uh, yeah. They do. They do. The documentation of a lot of, of ESPs and various mailbox providers have that in the documentation. And the reason I think they do that is they're just being ultra um, cautious. They, I, I don't like it. I, I think it is lazy, yeah, frankly. <laughs> because it's, uh, it's safe. No one's going to call support because uh, of a question mark all, or there's no, because it doesn't, it's, it's nothing. And so, yeah. There's a lot of, I could, I could, on the top of my head, I could name te 10 places that in their official documentation have the question mark all, and it's less than ideal. Um, so then, so you put in your, uh, so then after that we have uh, an include, um, I gave just spf.google. underscore spf.google.com, an IP and an IP block as examples. After you have your SPF record in place, it's just a simple TXT record, then the next thing you probably want to do is take, just kind of eyeball it. And to eyeball it, you know, just pick your favorite DNS lookup tool. It could be some kind of command, like dig, that's my favorite, or it could be an uh, online tool, whatever. Just take a look at the TXT record and see if it, is that everybody who sends email? It looks good. It looks like the syntax is right. 
So then after that, you want, you're going to want to validate the record. That's a step that a lot of people skip because they just assume, okay, it looks okay, it must be okay. But there are, there are problems, very common problems that you can run into. And I've kind of just compiled some greatest hits here just from my personal experience. I've, I've helped hundreds of people with this uh, sort of thing. So a, a common one, uh, a, an SPF record has a limit of 10 DNS lookups. That's, that makes sense. You know, you don't want an excessive DNS overhead. So it'll fail if it has more than 10 lookups. That's a solvable problem. Um, you're more likely to get that if you have a lot of includes, as, a, you know, as opposed to directly the IP address, like IP4, IP6. Um, so that's, that's, if you have a few of those in there, it's very likely you're going to be up over the 10 lookups. You know, it, there's, so there's things you can do. So remove, uh, there, a lot of times you'll see in an SPF record, there'll be mechanisms at the beginning of the record, like an MX. And with that, that will make an extra round of, of DNS lookups most of the time unnecessary. There are other ones as well. There, there are other ones as well um, that are unnecessary, A mechanism and so on. Generally, just a clean SPF record like you see is, is just fine. Um, a one you'll see commonly uh, a lot is a uh, PTR mechanism, which has been deprecated for at least a decade, but it's, you still see it there. Um, so, you know, you can, if you, and if you're still above 10 or at 10 DNS lookups, um, there's ways to flatten SPF records as well, uh, if necessary, to get it down there. So, uh, and then the last one I've already kind of covered. Um, those aren't, strictly speaking, errors. They're just kind in production, kind of worth, uh, useless. The question uh, mark all and the plus all. Lazy, as, as you noted, uh, probably. OK. So then on to DKIM. Um, so with DKIM, it's uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of providers make it pretty darn easy to implement compared to what it used to be, where you had to you know, have them generate the public key for you and all that. A lot of times, like I gave G Suite as an example here, and you log in and you, you click uh, start authenticating, uh, excuse me, generate a record, it generates the public key, you uh, have your selector and your host name, which essentially are just where you put in the host name field in your DNS. The value is the, the record itself, the public key. And you, and you click Start Authenticating, and that'll show you that, you're, that now Google is going to start signing each of your emails. Best practice is to get the SPF done first. So let's say you were using G Suite for your day-to-day -day email. You know, get, get, that, uh, get that done first, and then DKIM, and um, you know, go from there. Now DMARC, so this, the policy arm, uh, the policy part of this uh, stack is, uh, I'm going to start with some, some kind of, uh, some important points uh, uh, about it. Uh, by no means comprehensive, there's a lot to DMARC, a lot of different things you can do with it, and, uh, um, but we'll just go with the most important, which most people are going to find useful if they have a domain name. So, um, and it's, the structure, uh, the way it's generally done, just as a, uh, how you proceed with DMARC, is you start with just reporting. So here's that P equals none. That's policy equals none. That says, send me aggregate reports on what's, who's sending email with my domain, uh, authenticated or, or non-authenticated. And so every day you'll get this report. Um, and then if, you, if you've been doing that for a while, um, you know, it's kind of a judgment call. But is, are all the email streams authenticated? You know what's going on. The next step up is quarantine. You set the policy to quarantine. And what that does is says any 
emails that fail DMARC, and I'll get into details of what fail means in a, in a minute, but any, any emails that fail uh, DMARC uh, go, get sent to the spam folder. And I've tested this quite a bit, and it, it works well, and the, it, you, know, you go into your spam folder, and the email has this big banner, like, careful with this email, it's, you know, it's bad news. So it's, it's pretty good. And then finally, if you're completely confident, all, everybody you want to be sending email is sending email, and you're now ready to make it impossible for fishers and other scammers to use your domain name, you're ready to go up to P equals reject. And that says, DMARC fail, in, emails that fail DMARC, bounce them. And it does. It just uh, only DMARC compliant emails are going to get through. The rest, it just completely protects you from spoofing. So, all right. And there, there's, you can, uh, from there, you can add forensic reporting if you kind of are curious what these phishing emails kind of look like and, and so on. Um, you can get more information with, with forensic reporting. Reports are emailed to email aliases uh, for the, um, for the uh, aggregate reports. There's an email address you set for that. Um, and if you're doing forensic reporting, a separate, another email address you just put in there. And uh, you need some way to read XML um, to make it intelligible. Or you, you need a service uh, such as these are services that help with managing DMARC. And you know how Google AdWords, if you just got all that data, uh, not AdWords, um, analytics or things like that, web little, if you just got all that data emailed to you, it would, it would be hard to make sense of. So the interface there of Google Analytics kind of makes that intelligible. I can, these kind of services make the much less complex, but still somewhat complex uh, DMARC reporting easy to read, like who, who sh who's authenticated, who's not, wh who's likely bad news, and so on. So uh, Demartian Return Path Guide, these are just services that uh, help manage DMARC. And here's uh, here an example DMARC record, um, underscore DMARC in the host, example.com. Uh, so with aggregate reporting, uh, here we have just your basic um, TXT record. It sends uh, a report, and in here I'm using DMARC, Demartian, and uh, it just simply sends reports. So, so it's uh, visibility into your to into your email streams. That's that's what that basic report will give you. And then below, uh, just adding forensic reporting to the aggregate reporting. If you want to see more, you want to see the actual SMEB. Yeah. So, who is this that's doing this DMARC reporting? Is this a, a separate piece of software? Is it a piece of software that's standardized and it's doing everything like OSIX and the exchange and whatnot? Or, what is this DMARC thing? It's, this is all DNS asking, that's a standard, you, and it's asking the mailbox providers to provide these reports, and they do, because everybody's agreed to this standard. Not your host, but your, your, There you go. Yeah, and they and they even call it the aggregate report because uh, aggregate uh, because it is an aggregation of all the mailbox providers and so on. It's, uh, go, uh, yeah. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. So, yeah, all of these records that I'm talking about, um, so the, to, to repeat the question, it was about where you would find the, DMAR, uh, the various email authentication records. Great question. Um, these are all DNS TXT records. That's all they are. So there's no software you have to mess with. The only thing, uh, well, you've got to generate the key with, with those signing your, with DKIM. But other than that, this is adding TXT records to your DNS. So wherever your DNS host is, is where you would go. The zone file, if you will. The resource record is a type of record, the TXT record. When you look at you're going to get a DMARC record in the, the text documents. Uh, not, not DMARC.com root domain. In this case, it would be underscore DMARC as a standard. Uh, underscore DMARC.example.com. That would reveal the DMARC record. If we're talking about the root domain, if you did a check on the TXT record, f I think I went ahead here. Um, if you if you did um, sorry about that yeah well, I know it's a, uh, just a second it's not really doing there we go all right back to DMAR back to DMAR here all right so yeah so for D in DMARC's case, it's, as I mentioned, underscore DMARC, it would be the host name by convention, and then, uh, or by standard, better yet, and SPF, whatever the uh, SMTP from, the mail from, the LO from, is where, uh, SP uh, where SPF would be deployed. So it could be the root domain, it could be uh, let's say mail.domain.com, marketing.domain.com, or whatever. So whatever is in the, the mail from is typically where you put SPF. DKIM, uh, that, uh, while in DKIM, you don't have to, you don't put the record in the root domain. It's a TXT record still. Um, you have a D equals field within DKIM that specifies the domain, which is usually the friendly from domain. So there's a D equals field. So let's say that's example.com. Uh, and so the um, actual record host name includes a selector and then something else like domain key, the word domain, so dot underscore domain key, then the domain. And it's by standard, that's where the, the public key is. And so these are, so these, in essence, these are just all TXT records. The TXT records? The TXT records are a form of DNS record. So, um, they're in, so wherever your, your DNS is hosted, um, it, it, with a zone file, so wherever the name servers point, um, the zone file there will have A records. It'll have, you know, it'll have uh, C name records. It'll have, um, MX records, mail exchanger records. It'll have all the different types of resource records you would think of uh, with regard to a zone file. And one of those types of records is a TXT record, which originally was just around, I, I believe was created just to put, kind of put notes in a zone file. Like, oh, hey, we have, this is where our website is. Check out that IP address over there. And, our emails, you know, just whatever. You can put notes. It's called a TXT record because you can literally put anything in there. Uh, and then when the, team, uh, the I, I guess, what they call it, the, the Engineering Tax Task Force that deals with this sort of thing, uh, IETF, uh, or something like that, they, uh, when they started working on this problem, they were like, okay, TXT records seem like a reasonable approach. Let's, let's use those. So these, these are simple, T DNS TXT records um, that uh, in the zone file of for any domain name that you can use. Does that does that help? Yeah. yeah. So and then here uh, probably enough about these. All right. So then um, the final concept and any questions and answers if, if in discussion or whatever. Um, I wanted to go over. Um, 
uh, an important concept of DMARC that a lot of a lot of people don't know much about, uh, but is important, and that's identifier alignment with DMARC, because DMARC isn't just straight up, you know, does SPF pass or fail? Does DCAM pass or fail? There's more to it than that, and so uh, that's uh, that's where this comes in. I thought this image, which I got from Bruce Mark, who's a source, would be useful. So just walking down this image, I think anyone who's going to be implementing email authentication would do well to, to make sure they understand the concept of, of alignment and how DMARC passes or fails, and also what constitutes passing and what constitutes failing. So, and, the, and the consequences here are what AML bounces, you know, with the most aggressive DMARC policy, but definitely affects deliverability regardless. So uh, the receiving email gets the email, and it extracts the DKIM, let's start with DKIM, the DKIM signature from the email, and it wonders, does that match the friendly from domain? And if the answer is yes, great. On the, if then it goes on to the next step in the flow chart. If the answer is no, then we have failure. So no, do not pass go right there. So on to failure. But if, it, if the domains match, that is, if the D equals domain, in this case example.com of DMARC, excuse me, DKIM, matches the friendly from address, the one the user friend sends, the one you type in when you write someone an email, if those two match, and I'll get into strict and, and relaxed alignment in a second, but just generally speaking, if they, if they match, then great, you go on to the next step. And then did DKIM pass? If DKIM passed, then you have both DKIM passed and the domains were in alignment, we have a, uh, a thumbs up. So that's one thumbs up. That's enough to pass DMARC, because DMARC is an or thing. Uh, and so either, Ideally, both would pa be aligned and pass, but if either of them pass and are in alignment, then DMARC passes. And so that, uh, you know, gives a little more flexibility because there are certain things that can break one or the other of them, and so this is deemed to be sort of more reasonable. So uh, on the other side, we have SPF um, here, and for SPF, the domain is extracted uh, from the mail from, the SMTP from, return path from, whatever you want to call it, but the from name down to the you know, that the users don't see, right down in the headers, where the email is really from. So that, so do the domains match? Yes. Then go on to does SPF pass? Yes or no. If yes, it passes. So. You either want you both or one or the other of these passes and DMARC passes. If both fail, then you know DMARC fails. So that's um, that's important to understand when doing DMARC. The concept of alignment is probably one of the most misunderstood concepts uh, with great regard to email authentication. Um, so it's worth noting here in those many sort of gradations and subtleties, but just broad strokes, there are two possibilities uh, on how you can set things. You can set strict alignment, or you can set um, relaxed alignment. Strict alignment means the domain has to, to match, the domains have to match precisely. And if you're, there are some types of companies where that like maybe financial service, health, health and so on, where they've got to be kind of hardcore about this kind of thing, where that might be appropriate, where that might be the thing they have to do, you know. But for the majority of implementations, your uh, relaxed, um, com relaxed alignment is just fine. So what this means is with relaxed alignment, you have to match the organizational domain name in the parlance of email authentication. So organizational domain is usually the root domain, not always, but it's basically you get one atom away from the root domain. So, and so that covers most use cases. So for example, uh, with relaxed, uh, let me finish this one thought then. 
so with relaxed, um, mail.example.com would be in alignment with example.com. Example.com is the organizational domain. With strict, mail.example.com would be out of alignment uh, with, because, you know, it, it's not precisely the same. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, and the parlance, uh, well, I think maybe I'm using the, the terminology wrong, but when I think of the top level, uh, when I think of example.com, a company's domain name, I, I tend to call that a root domain. I don't know if I'm using the wrong terminology. I might be. Yeah, root domain is above com. Oh, oh okay. So, the root domain, okay. Okay, yeah, D okay, F fair enough, fair enough, yeah. Uh, a question for you about, uh, so recently I, I was looking at somebody's site and they, and they had a WordPress, so it was like example.com slash WordPress, or slash WP uh, slash, and then they had their website, I guess they were, where, however they had their site set up, it was inside of another folder. Are they using a, they're using a subdomain? Uh, they're using like a, a folder subdomain. Okay, so the, I think the question is uh, is about subdomains and whether they can cause problems with email authentication. And I would say if you're going to be sending emails with that subdomain, then you definitely want to set up an SPF record directly in that uh, subdomain's uh, DNS. Uh, you want to add, you know, right there. But if you are using relaxed uh, uh, alignment, especially, um, you can just have, you don't have to deal with everything, just the SPF record in that one. So I don't think it necessarily causes havoc because this system's kind of designed to deal with subdomains, through, especially through the relaxed identifier alignment. Yes? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question here is, uh, there's a couple branch. There's two. There seem to be two evolutionary branches here. Um, at one of, no, no, just branches of. Uh, here, one of them is um, for the mail from, and one of them is for the friendly from. And the reason for that is that um, SPF, Center Policy Framework Record, was created for. Uh, is designed to look at the mail from. And so the SPF side of this uh, chart extracts from the, uh, the uh, mail from domain, the, the real from, if you will, the return path, whatever you want to call it. On the other, on the other side, on the DKIM side of this flow chart, we have our DKIM D equals domain which is the friendly from, the one you type in when you write someone an email, the one the user sends, sees when they receive an email. So the logic of this here in alignment is we're extracting the DKIM signature, we're extract, extracting the from address email domain name, the, the, friend, uh, the friendly from, if you will, uh, that's why I like to call it, the friendly from, the one the user sees, and then we have the envelope from, there you have it. Okay, so the envelope from, and then the return path, uh, the uh, mail from domain is uh, extract as well. So there, a DKIM signature domain, that is the D, D equal, the, uh, the envelope, envelope from, and, and the uh, mail from, right here. And so, in the case of DKIM, does the D equals domain, the D can specified, does it match the envelope from? If yes, then it continues. 
And does DKIM pass? Yes. Then we have a winner. If no, to either of those. If the domains don't match, they're out of alignment. Uh, they go to no. If DKIM doesn't pass, even if the domains are in alignment, we still get a no. So that the DKIM side would, would fail. On this side, we have our envelope from the uh, return path, or return path, whatever you want to call it, the envelope from, and we have the, um, the from name uh, to the, um, excuse me, you, and the SPF domain name. And do the domains match? That is, did F SPF get done on, on the return path? And is it valid? And do they match? So if they match and are valid, we get a yes. If they either don't match or it fails SPF, the SPF record doesn't have that IP in there or whatever, then we get a no. So they have to, the domains have to be in alignment. So a fully aligned, strictly aligned email would be example.com everywhere you looked. So the envelope from would be example.com, the, uh, the return path domain, the mail from domain would be example.com, the, S the word SPF, the, uh, the friendly from would be example.com. Uh, they would all match. That's a fully aligned, uh, strictly speaking. Um, then relaxed, you could have some sub, you could have subdomains like commonly you'd find Bouncer, for example, if it's in ESP. I worked at ESP for a while, uh, years. Uh, you would find, you know, say bouncer.example.com in that, uh, in that uh, mail frame. Yeah? So, so the, the strict versus relaxed is the difference between do both sides have to pass or can just one side? No, in both cases, in both uh, strict and relaxed, both sides, uh, um, excuse me, only, uh, only one side has to pass to get DMARC to pass. Um, it, so the, uh, the relaxed versus strict narrowly refers to whether you have to have an exact match with the uh, organizational domain. So, so over here, this, if, let's just assume relaxed, which is what most people have been using. Let's just assume this was something dot, let's just call it mail.example.com over here. If that, that would still all be in alignment according to relaxed. And in both cases, only one side has to pass uh, to get the email to pass. So, for example, like a, a mailing list, you would yeah. have a, a different envelope sender or envelope from than, than the user's from. The, us, uh, the mailing list is going to send it on behalf of the user. So, what would happen? How does a mailing list get controlled? Mailing list. Ah. Yeah, so, so the, the questions here are about, I think, when you're using third-party services, um, you know, what happens and whether, how strict and, and relaxed apply there. Um, and I would say that it, you can use MailChimp and still have relaxed alignment check out. Because if you are sending from, I believe, anyway, if you, send, if you set up to send from MailChimp, you can have your own, set up with your own domain in both the, the envelope from and, and the mail from, the return path from, uh, uh, then you can set, so you can have it pass across the board. I don't know if MailChimp requires you to use a subdomain or something for the mail from, uh, but I think you could have 
and the, I, I don't, there are a lot of, I'd say that this isn't, I, I, I'm not going to make a bold statement, I, I, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's a, uh, it's possible that there are exceptions to this, but I, I don't believe who's sending it is, is the key thing when it comes to relax versus um, a strict. It's all about the domain. So, when I, uh, so as long as you can set up whatever service it is, MailChimp, uh, G Suite, SendGrid, you name it, your, your postfix service, as long as you can set it up with your own domain names, then... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, oh, you're talking about mailing lists, like okay. I gotcha. I got you now. All right. I, right. Yeah, you're talking about forwarding in that case. Yeah. 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 I see your point. Okay. So uh, we got off on a little bit off from your question. You, uh, you weren't asking about third-party senders like MailChimp. You were talking about major domo <laughs> and listserv and that sort of thing, which forward. So those kind of things, generally speaking, will break SPF because of what you're talking about. But the DKIM signature can stay intact. So by the logic of DMARC, it can still pass because the DMARC side stays in alignment sta and passes, but I would think in that situation, SPF would fail. And that, you can make it so that that, or they can make it so that that's okay. So whatever is hosting your, your mail address. I don't, I don't know if they have to make it okay. I, I'm just suggesting that if you sent an email, if you sent to a mailing list, how, what would happen with regard to email authentication? Right. SPF would break. DKIM would stay intact, assuming alignment, the DKIM side would pass, therefore DMARC would pass. So you're okay, in essence, you are okay sending to mailing lists, and that's the reason for this, uh, this, di this dual system dichotomy, if you will, not dichotomy, but just the reason for two chances is because of things that tend to break one versus the other. So it was a little flat, it was a little brittle just to have one. So, so in the mailing list case, um, DMARC, signatures can, DMARC signatures can survive forwarding, SPF cannot. Okay, so I, I think this was my oh, it doesn't. Oh, is there a setting? Oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. I, you know, that is a question I don't know. Sorry. That's a good question, though, because there, there, um, I can imagine scenarios where someone would say, I don't want emails to be forwarded in any way. Let's, I don't know, let's say they're just some healthcare company. I don't know anything about regulations and stuff. But just say that scenario. They don't want emails to be forwarded uh, anyway, whether it's a mailing list or other way. The, and they want, they only want emails to be considered legit if they pass both. I, I bet you there's a, I would just predict there's a setting for that. And if you wanted to, I, um, if, you, if you looked in the docs, and I'm going to look now, I'm curious, I, I would predict you would find those, because there's a lot of configuration you can do. I hope that helped. I would say, yeah, yeah, uh, strict, well, that's a good question. Uh, subdomains are, are, are going to be under your control, chances are, so it's not super concerning, but I would say if you could success, if, it, if you could set it up with strict, and it would work for your company, or I would personally, just my bias is I would go for it because that's more secure. And ultimately, really, this is security. And so it's more secure, and there's not much downside. There's no downside because you're not really using subdomains. So I would say, and this is more of an opinion, that, that yeah, you would go for it. But, and, and there would be no technical problems because you're not using subdomains, so you're not breaking uh, strict 
alignment. So, yeah. Yeah, good, good points. Oh, you, oh, you're asking, or you're more I mean, that's thinking out loud? That's where my question comes from. But now, at this point, I figured out how to correctly configure Postfix to send from our domain. So I might as well go with strict all the way. Yeah. It seems like to me. That's what you want. You can also start with the reporting thing, like you said. Sure. Yeah. That, you bring up a good point. Um, so that, that graduated thing, uh, like, P equals none breaks nothing, it just reports. And then P equals quarantine um, just sends the things to spam, so it breaks things less. And then we've got our P equals reject, big trouble. So over a few months, maybe, somebody's graduating up from those. So that, uh, I, hope, I hope that helped. Yes, sir. Um, do you have any idea of how things like spam houses block lists are used today? Spam house. Oh, yes. Um, I wouldn't call myself an expert on spam house. Uh, they're, the, they're the boogeyman uh, of email. Um, if you, how they're used, I don't know exactly how they're used, but. Um, when people get on a spam house block, it's big trouble. I just had a client, uh, I do freelancing consulting, that kind of thing, uh, and I had a client that was helping, and they're just ordinary emails, it's just a spam house story, just very recently, within the last couple of weeks. They're ordinary emails that they just sent, just, you know, with business associates and whatnot. They had gotten their domain <laughs> on spam house, and they couldn't, they had their, this is like a real estate agent or something, and they had their, um, uh, they had their domain name in, in their signature. Or, and because it was in the body of the email, it was detected, and their email was sent to spam even when they sent, because they realized it was happening and they stopped using the domain, and they just start, started using their normal Gmail account but they kept their signature the same, and all their emails went to spam. I mean, they couldn't f get an email into the inbox or whatever in front of, no one saw their email to save their life because there's, there's domain. So the, the spam house is trouble. They're, uh, it's a good reason not to, if the moral imperative not to spam is not enough or, or whatever, uh, the fact that there are services like Spam House out there should be a distance, big disincentives because they really can hammer people. They'll uh, not just block IP addresses, they'll block domains, and that domain just shows up in an email. Um, I've heard of cases where they'll block, they'll, it'll affect a person's website, the SEO, maybe even make their website unreachable. I mean, Spam House is the, I don't know if king is quite the right word, but they're the the most aggressive, hardcore, death metal, spam, uh, whatever, uh, that there is. Are they still useful if we have things like Zcash? Yeah. yeah. Are they definitely useful. Because all, all this does, this doesn't say anything, and maybe I should have made this part of my presentation. When you make a presentation, you have to leave a lot out. And maybe I, sh I, maybe I should have included this. But uh, SPF and DCAM make new, statements about good or bad, or spam or not spam. So if I, if bank of, uh, bank, I don't want to name a specific bank, uh, xyzbank.com is spelled xyzbank.com, the bank is if implementing this is simply making it so a fisher can't literally send email as xyzbank.com, right? And can't ruin xyzbank.com's the uh, reputation, can't spread malware with that domain, can't, uh, threat actors can't do 
bad things with the actual domain and ruin the reputation domain, which get that domain on spam house, etc. Send millions of emails. However, uh, close misspellings, uh, X, uh, what's next to Y? I don't know. Just something that looks like X, XYZ bank.com, which has a website design just like XYZ bank.com. The emails are prof prof it's professionally done looking email. Uh, there's, as, as, as we know, that people can have lookalike or misspelling type of domains that can do a pretty good job of, spamming, of, of scamming people. Those can be fully authenticated. So any domain can be authenticated uh, through the techniques we see, he, see here. So we, if you see, we receive an email that's authenticated, all it says is this comes from xazbank.com this fissure and that it's fully authenticated, but it doesn't say that um, this is good news. So there's no ju there's no statement there. So what? So that for that reason, the spam um, what do they call them? Spam lists, uh, blacklists. Excuse me, blacklists. The blacklists definitely have a, a very strong role to play because they through two two mechanisms that I know of. Uh, d identify, or at least, at least two, identify um, problematic senders, spammers, fishers, and so on. People can report, you know, abuse, obviously. Uh, one can report to these uh, various entities. They can also, there's also spam traps that um, are email addresses that um, have, you know, are no longer valid, and instead of just retiring them, the, I, the ISP makes them into a spam trap. There are pristine sp spam traps, which are email addresses that are specifically put out in the wild to catch spammers, and there are misspelling um, type of spam traps, which just look very similar, and these are put out in the world in order to catch people who are sending from, let's take our example, xazbank.com, put them on blacklists, make their perfectly authenticated email less likely to land in, your, in front of you. You'll probably never see it. Chances are you will never see it. They, um, and, and Google and, and uh, other uh, services have come a long way with the filters. So uh, that, <laughs> that could be a whole other talk on, uh, on email deliverability. Uh, on, the th on the factors that affect it, but I definitely thumbs up on the blacklist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It looks awesome, but yeah, it's total spam. Yeah. Or they have some really, really, really bad contact form that's not checking things, and so they're just sending out stuff through that, or um, whatever it is. They're now like not quite watching people. Uh, so that sort of stuff happens. So you can do all of this stuff perfectly, but because the rest of the stuff is not secure, you're getting blacklisted um, from the Yeah. I th yeah, you make a great point for those of you here. She was, she was noting that um, it's not even necessarily a result of your actions that can result in uh, blacklists and other deliver and reputation problems with the IP address. It could be people you're sharing a hosting with. And, you are, and I run into that all the time. You must work with some of the same kind of customers I do. <laughs> because uh, a common uh, thing I run into, and this is tangentially related to to email authentication, so sorry, slightly off topic, but uh, I do run into frequently that exact situation, more or less. <laughs> uh, the, okay, that situation where um, somebody will be on shared hosting, um, or even will have a dedicated IP, but it's already sullied, or it's on three blacklists, and they haven't really done much with it. It's just 
that web hosting services consider themselves web hosting services, not, not email hosting. And so that's not really their core business. They don't take very good care of their IP addresses and they don't really deal with abuse and they don't. So I see it all the time. And often the solution, frankly, is to move them to some sort of service that focuses more on email hosting, like G Suite or whatever. Um, uh, that instantly the solution in those cases is to get out of that shared environment where there are some people abusing the IP. Same thing happens at ESPs if you're sharing an IP. Um, so yeah. So. Yes. Yeah, please. Please. Yeah, send a policy framework record, SPF, yeah. So that was a lot of like white list, white listing IP addresses and stuff. And so I, I, that makes sense when you're using, uh, you know, Gmail, something like that. So, you, you know, you could be wherever you could, you know, you, your location could be a different IP address, but it ends up being Google's IP that actually sends it out. So that works. Exactly. Well, you're talking, I think, about ISP-assigned IP addresses, which usually are discounted when delivery. You'll find them in the email headers, deep in the email headers. You'll find those IP, they don't mean much. So I see what you're saying, like the hotel you're staying at is different than whatever, you know, that sort of thing. That doesn't generally affect, it could, I suppose, in theory, but it doesn't, typically. The only, the thing is where the mail, how the mail is sent. So that, that postfix server, that, uh, that uh, G Suite, that uh, whatever it is. Uh. Yeah. 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 Excellent point there. So the yeah. So what IP matters, and he was noting the MTA uh, is where where it matters, not uh, you know where your the actual box you're on, unless that happens to be MTA, which is unlikely. Yeah. So yes, please. Last question, by the way. Yeah. Oh. So uh, the question here is, what if you're hosted with a hosting service? Could it be, could it be any hosting service, well, or those in particular? I'm thinking like Weebly, you know, where you just go and you create a website. Oh, oh yeah. Weebly, okay, so there's there. Uh, the question was, if you have your website at Weebly, uh, which is a web hosting company that has a website builder associated with it, like it's kind of like Wix, I think there's some other ones. So the question was, does that, do you still need to do email authentication? And yes, uh, uh, yes, you do. Um, so the web hosting aspect is separate from your, your, your email hosting. So while your email could be hosted at Wix, it doesn't necessarily have to be. But if it is, and you're using your own domain name, you probably should, email, uh, you should implement e email authentication. And uh, since the records, the, the uh, mail can be hosted somewhere else entirely. You could have your email. I, I know I keep going back to G Suite, but it's kind of like one of the bigger ones, or Office 365. Or yeah, G Suite, is, I like it. It just, it just works. It just works. Um, so, so you could have your website at Weebly and your email anywhere else. Just. The two don't have to necessarily peek together, so, even if they share a domain. So there's two different types of records. So with your website, 
you're, you know, with, we're just focusing on email. Your email routing is controlled by the MX records in your zone file. And so those MX records can point anywhere that can host email. You just go in your DNS and decide how you want to route your email. So this has been a lot of fun. I, uh, I, this was great. I've been nervous for like a week because, uh, you know, public speaking and all that. But thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. And thanks for coming out to hear about a somewhat arcane subject. I appreciate that. One more time, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. That was great. So uh, I want to let everybody know they can totally hang out for a little while. Um, I'm going to be shooting out an email about web devs and it not happening the next couple months and what we're going to do in the next couple months if we do anything. And uh, probably a call to if anybody wants to do talks for next year. Uh, I'll probably take January and then after that it'll probably be open. But that's still up in the air because it's not even close to January. Um, if anybody wants a t-shirt, the lovely Bell Kim over there will be handing out some of the t-shirts that I took because uh, what? There are three smalls and six extra extra large. <laughs> okay, so if anybody wants one, they're just shirts that have been sitting here for like two years and just trying to give people t-shirts. So everyone, everybody, thanks for coming. Um, looks like there's no more pizza, but feel free to hang out and bother Neil as much as you like. <laughs>